Hello, and welcome back to the Masonic Roundtable, a weekly program where Masons from around the world get together to talk about Masonic news and opinions in a friendly and social manner. As a reminder, the thoughts and opinions expressed here are solely the opinions of the participants and do not represent any Grand Lodge statements or positions. Make sure you keep your conversations open for the public and on the level. To interact with us, as always, we love seeing you all live on Thursday nights on Facebook or on YouTube. So hello and good evening to all of you in the chat. Otherwise, check the chat replay and join in the conversation. You know me. My name is John Ruark. I'm a past master of the Patriot Lodge, number 1957. There's my name in Fairfax, Virginia. And next up, we have Jason Richards. Good uh, Hello and good evening, Jason. Hello and good evening. Jason Richards, past master of Acacia Lodge number 16 in Clifton, Virginia, member of the Colonial Lodge number 1821 and Lafayette Lodge number 79 out of Zanesville, Ohio, which has been in the news quite a bit uh, over the past week, at least in the Masonic news. Mm -hmm. All right, next up. Joe Martinez. Hello and good evening. Hello. Good evening. Joe Martinez. Pisces. Uh, let's see. This week I am the uh, current master of Manassas Lodge number 182 in Manassas, Virginia. Still a member of Benjamin B. French Lodge in the District of Columbia and a member of Ezekiel Bates Lodge. No number because it's Massachusetts in Attleboro, Massachusetts. Great to be here. Excellent. Excellent. Next up we have Robert Johnson. Hello and good evening, Robert. Hello and good evening, everybody. Uh, good to be with you. Uh, this is uh, an auspicious occasion. We're like back. It feels like forever. Anyway, uh, past master walking in lodge, current sitting secretary at Space Novum, 1183 in Libertyville, Illinois. And that's it. Thanks. And that, that's all for now. We were here last week too, Robert. Well, I wasn't, so there. I missed that. Yeah, yeah, years, though. Your absence was noted. <laughs> Yeah, Christmas, the holiday season is over, Santa. I just let it grow, man. I let it grow. No trim and no nothing. November to, I don't know, probably March or something. Oh, it's like it's okay, last Santa. week told me that, uh, last week Joe told me I tripped and like dunked my chin in sour cream or something. <laughs> oh, because you got all that gray. Yeah, man. I mean, I can, yeah. we can twist out the mustache and do whatever oh, we want. Gosh. It'd be crazy. Yeah, there we go. Bunch of wild and crazy guys. Next up, <laughs> our special guest of the evening, Brother Ryan Flynn. Hello and good evening. Hello. Hi. Uh, Brother Hello. Ryan Flynn. I'm a member of Phoenix Lodge number 105 in uh, Tilton, New Hampshire. I'm also a member of Blackmer 127 in uh, Mount Gilead, North Carolina. And uh, if they let me in as of next week, I too will be a member of Ezekiel Bates Lodge. In Woo! Home of Masonic Con. No more. <laughs> yeah. Former. Yes. Can you let me know? Like, I'll have to check the minutes, see how that goes. Because if you get in, I'm demitting. <laughs> I second that. What, what yeah. did uh, Groucho Mark say? I, I wouldn't would not want to be part of an organization that would have me as a member. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> So Much good. So good. <laughs> <laughs> no, seriously though, fingers crossed for you. That's awesome that uh, so many of us have uh, pluraled up over there. I like it. Yeah. Well, the bribe is pretty sizable, so hopefully, hopefully we get in there. <laughs> well, you you might be the only one in here who gets it, but yes. <laughs> hey, awesome. So. Uh, before we get into tonight's show, definitely want to give a shout out to all the patrons who've been supporting the show for the past couple of years. You guys are awesome and help us keep bringing on special guests like Ryan Flynn. So thank you. And if you want to support the show, head over to, what's it, patreon.com slash the Masonic Real Table and uh, join our little secret squirrel group where we can talk about cool Masonic stuff in our backstage access. So we'll see you there. Awesome. So this has been a long time coming um, because we, we actually realized many years into the show, we've never had Ryan Flynn on. And we're like, wait a minute, I thought we had, no, I thought you were going to invite him. I thought you were going to invite him. And uh, a little birdie yeah, said. I, I thought it was something personal. I had a list might... like Steve and uh, no. Billy Madison just scratching you guys off. And I tell you. <laughs> Do you have the lipstick too? No comment. <laughs> okay. So yeah, okay. definitely Understood. nothing personal. At least that's what we'll say publicly. So, finally, glad to have you on here. 
right? Um, <laughs> and and uh, geez, you know, it it's it's really fascinating. As we were talking a little bit in the green room too, you know, we wanted to bring you on especially because of your vocation and how you've chosen to be both a mason and an artist and make really kick butt masonic art that uh is really unparalleled and that uh more important good masonic art is really hard to find mostly it's like photoshopped memes with like you know words cut off and things like that true hey that hurts because i am i am a i am a masonic artist if that's if that's a professional memer yeah um (laughs) And don't worry, they'll get more likes than my art anyway. So, <laughs> oh, please. Oh, my gosh. Not further from. The Can I get a casual smib? <laughs> yes. Throw that in the chat. And yeah. and so also another thing we wanted to talk about is your process, because one thing that um, that you go above and beyond doing on your 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 social media is to walk through. I think it's very rare that you see artists walk through the process sometimes reversing like going back or painting over something and that's i i enjoy it because it shows people that it's not easy and that it's 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 a process that goes through multiple stages of of rebirth as it were but we'll get into all that all that fun detail so let's start from the beginning then uh ryan how did you get interested in art um Joseph anticipating an answer already. Um, so no, excited. Um, I was really, there may I was may really not fortunate. Be a, uh, a, a secret word that, that comes out. Yeah. Um, no, um I was I was always into art as a kid and um I was really fortunate enough to go to a high school where I had like awesome awesome art teachers. Um, I was a complete nerd, like art nerd, you know, everybody else was out hanging out, having a social life. And, uh, I was in the art room alone doing my thing and loved every minute of it. And I had an art teacher who would just push me harder than everybody else. I don't think I ever actually got an A in art in high school just because he was like, you can do better. You can do better. You can do better. Um, so yeah, I started off with that. Uh, I had, um, I also have my aunt who, um, always took me to art museums and, and just kept taking me to new places so I could experience me to my first art shows and uh, just generated a love for art and music since I was a kid. And um, I went through a brief moment in college where I didn't want to do this, or at least I didn't think I wanted to be in the arts or be creative for a while. And it lasted exactly six months and realized I was miserable without it and stuck to it ever since. So, um, Took up a degree in graphic design so that I could just be creative and have a job. I was going to ask, and, you, <laughs> is, is this uh, an actual thing that you've studied? Sorry? Is this something you actually studied at art and did say graphic yeah, design? Yeah, so uh, I eventually went uh, changed schools and I, I, um, I graduated from UMass with a degree in fine art and graphic design. Um, and then uh, in my fourth year of college, I studied abroad in Florence. We all do <laughs> So if any of you have ever met Ryan in person, not only will he tell you every time that he studied in Florence, Italy, uh, but has become a uh, a joke du jour every time you see him. So uh, yeah. here's to you, Ryan. Do people to- I don't know come Florence. up to me and say, like, yeah. people who I don't know will come up to me at a lodge and just say, like, hey, Florence, I'm like, yeah. <laughs> so... But um, we're going to no, throughout up. this episode, we're going to show various pictures of Ryan and I in Florence, Italy. <laughs> Florence. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we're not going to get anything accomplished. So what did you do in Florence? I, no, I didn't not, realize Firenze was so pixelated. <laughs> hey, yeah. you're judging. It's and we don't like in person. I, ha- I, I have a real question for, for Brother person. Ryan when we're done. Nobody uh-huh. cares. <laughs> I have a question. I have a question. I have a question. Okay. What's your question? Ryan. So hey Ryan, never so been... you know had a <laughs> oh jeez, you're gonna get me to curse and break the TMR rule like right now. Um, All right. Ryan, All right. I've never heard you say that for uh, a, a spell of time you were maybe considering not doing it. So what were you thinking of doing instead of art for that six month window? Um, stripper. I really didn't. Mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> that. Um, no, I really didn't. Uh... <laughs> plan so i my my um 
my high school was a private Christian high school, and um, they kind of forced, I don't want to say forced, but they pushed you towards uh, Christian colleges. And I went to uh, a school and I just didn't fit in. It wasn't it wasn't for me at all. I met some good friends and I, I, I call it my $30,000 finder's fee for my wife uh, <laughs> because that's really all I got out of it. Um, but um, just being away from a place where you know, creativity didn't seem to be flourishing or welcome unless it was in their version of, of creative creativity, uh, just kind of made me realize that this wasn't for me. And, um, you know, I remember like, I'd be there and I'd be like still doodling and painting and stuff. And I just put my stuff up in like the mess hall just to show somebody. And, uh, it, you know, it just eventually turned into why am I doing this? I'm, I'm not happy here. Let's, let's do what I'm supposed to be doing. Um, so like I said, I went back into graphic design, uh, just so I knew I could get a job after high school that is creative that eventually turned into marketing. But, um, when I went to UMass, uh, I was really unhappy with the art teaching there. Like I, I wasn't learning anything. It was more like arts and crafts and no one was pushing me at all. Like it was like, oh, you're so great. You know, you're doing great. Look what Ryan did. I'm like, I just pulled this out of my tuchus. Like you're not making me learn. And um, that like all joking aside, when, when I decided to study abroad, I went to the like the heart of art. Like, all right, this is art on a completely different level. Um, and the, you know, I, I took a class in 14th century Italian architecture um, and I took a class in painting and then art history. And, you know, art, when you learn art history over there, it's, it's not like reading from a book. It's like, all right, we're going to go over to Michelangelo's house and you're going to see the floor where he carved David. Okay, let's do that. That is <laughs> um, super All right, cool. now we're going to walk across there and, you know, we're going to take a bus to Rome and we're going to go into the Sistine Chapel early so you can see it before the tourists get there. Okay. You're kidding me, right? <laughs> that is amazing. So, um, yeah, so it it wasn't really just like the, the classes were kind of easy, but it was just the experience of just appreciating art on a level that you'd never get a chance to over here. Um, and that's kind of when I came back from that trip, uh, it was like, all right, new me. And um, then I was, I just got into it, started reading books about symbolism and art and just ate it up. Um, and, you know, I, I came back, I got out of college, got married. My wife likes art too. She's big into theater. So, you know, we were always, listen to music, going to theater, going to art museums and that sort of stuff. And it was just a core aspect. Of my life. I mean, it still is obviously. Ryan, I got a question for you, buddy. Yep. For those of us uh, who can't make it over to, you know, Italy, um, I was fortunate enough as a, as a kid, Navy brat, uh, I spent, you know, time in Naples, Italy, and we got to go a lot of great places. And I have to say, like, it was, so life-changing to see stuff over there um and then having found like a, an appreciation for renaissance and enlightenment art um coming home it was really difficult to find living in um non-classical i like big city areas where i didn't really have access to see a lot of this really cool art that um you could just see driving down the road in europe so my question is um you know, before we dive into a lot of the great things, you know, you're going to shed some light on is for people here in the United States, like, what do you think, or where are some, based on your own experiences, places to see some awesome artworks that you particularly enjoy? Like, I know you're the, the, the type of things that you're into and what you studied. Is there a place to see that great work here in the United States? Yeah, and it's going to sound like a completely campy answer, and that's, that's cool. everywhere. Yeah. Um, so I, I actually wrote this down probably a month ago because I'm attempting to write right now, and that's not my art form. Uh, but um, I had I had this one story that happened to me over this one instance that like really was a watershed moment for me. And um, so we had taken a bus to Hadrian's villa, Emperor Hadrian. He had this villa outside of Rome. Uh, a city or a town called Tivoli and um, it's all in ruins and stuff like that and you know we were we were there early so it's just like hey go go explore um, and um, I remember I was I was 
sitting at this lecture called at this place called the uh, Aqua Theater, which is um, a stage that's surrounded by uh, a pond, basically, or a moat where plays would have been done for Emperor Hadrian. And um, teacher was talking to us and I was in the back leaning against this, you know, 2000 year old wall. And um, I ADD kicked in and I started looking at the wall and I, it sounds corny, but I found a, a mark in the mortar where 2000 years ago, the Mason put his thumb in there and dragged it to, to smooth it out. And you could see that it was a thumb print moving uh, over it. And, you know, all of a sudden, you know, it clicked on like a different kind of level where, all right, I'm not standing at this, I'm not standing in a structure. I'm standing in something, something somebody made a long time ago. And this person who made it, who I'll never know, I'll never know his name, but he cared about this so much that he put his thumb in wet cement to make sure that it looked good. Um, so I, it was kind of like, wow, that's, that's pretty cool. And then uh, a few days later, we were climbing Brunelleschi's dome and we had a class at the top of it. And while I was climbing the last part of the stairs, you know, the, there's stairs inside the dome that spiral up. And at the end, there's like a, like a very steep climb. And while I was waiting for this person to go up in front of me, I looked to my left and there in the mortar there was another thumbprint. And, you know, it just hit me. I'm like, oh, this is everywhere. Like, this is, this is, this is like, this isn't a building. It's a work of art itself. And how many people pass through this and see that little smudge and don't realize what it is. And I, I distinctly remember coming back um, and, you know, I, I, I lived in Mass at the time, so I flew back into Boston. And like a couple months after we went into Boston and um, there's Trinity Church in Copley Square. And, you know, I just remember looking at it differently. You know, like that's not just a church that's 100 and, or whatever years old. That's the same thing. This is this is a work of art in front of me. And. Um, you know, I joke a lot and everybody jokes around like going to Florence and stuff, but like that, that moment really changed how I looked at everything. And, um, when people ask, you know, like what kind of art in America are you like, you know, I've been fortunate enough to see, you know, a lot of museums in the country and yeah, sure. You can go to the Met and, and you know, see Washington cross in Delaware. You can go to the MoMA and see starry night. Um, or, you know, you can do the Ferris Bueller thing in Chicago and see, um, you know, a Sunday afternoon on the jot. But, um, you know, it's those little places, too, are just are, are incredible. You just got to look at it in the right way. You just got to figure out how to have that connection. Mm -hmm. And that connection is going to be very different for me than it is for you. And that's the beauty of art. Like, it, mm -hmm. it's one of these arguments that um, I don't like a lot of people saying, like, Oh, modern art is an art and stuff. You know, I hear that a lot. Or modern architecture is an architecture or that sort of thing. Well, you know, that's you. That's your opinion. That's your view. And your view is great for you. But, you know, there are people who literally get wheeled into MoMA on their deathbed so that they could see abstract art one last time before they die. Right. You telling me they don't know what they're talking about? Mm -hmm. <laughs> so it's just look instead of looking for the art, look for that connection and then just embrace it. And love it. We'll get something out of it. You know, a, a billboard could be funny. And I have a picture of a, <laughs> I have a picture of a National Lampoon cover that is a dog with a uh, revolver to its head. And it says, if you don't buy this magazine, the dog gets it. Like, that's a great piece of art. And it's hilarious too, you know? <laughs> it makes me laugh. <laughs> yeah, I think for, <clears throat> for me, I personally love going to like art fairs and like flea market art exhibits and things like that because it doesn't get any any better for me than like seeing local artists showcasing their talent that's that's one place that i find that and just absolutely love it there's always a diamond in the rough there too like you'll see people who are like crafting and it's great and then you just see it like why are you here like you need to go bigger go better you know get a show <laughs> which is yeah. awesome to find those people so Little hint, don't bring Ryan Flynn to any art fairs you go to because he will sit there and yell at all the little people that are doing art. Yeah. So Especially kids. Yeah, You're I doing like, it wrong. I like yell at kids. Yeah. Why yeah. would you choose that palette? It's yeah. horrible. You call it blue? <laughs> Stick figure does not have enough chiaroscuro. <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> Again, that's a good one. I've gotten a higher res picture. <laughs> See, I it's me. I, I didn't know we were sharing. This is me at Herculaneum when I was Ooh. like nine. Yeah, it's really hard that glare, huh? How about that? All kinds of really cool art there, man. Like I, it just blows your mind. Anyway. Now, Show us some thing. real pictures, Joe. I know you got them. There's some real pictures somewhere. He'll, so he'll, there's he'll so, all right. So if we're gonna do Not that, that yeah. kind of pictures. Yeah, my favorite experience <laughs> with Ryan in Florence was Ryan. Tell us where we are. Right there. Where are we? Uh, I don't know. It's the that Duomo, like, right? Yeah. That, that looks like Baltimore. No. Yeah. <laughs> yes, Definitely that is Baltimore. the Duomo. That's the ugliest painting in Florence, by the way. Ooh. Oh, wow. Ooh. It looks great from down there, but if you go up to the front, Vasari made some really horrible decisions, including a giant hole in the middle of Jesus' face. <laughs> I know that. Well, yeah, again. <laughs> Should have aimed, aimed for the hands. So, yeah. uh, the... Damn, I was going to make the joke, and I didn't. <laughs> it was a softball, dude. <laughs> I, Christian I thought it and was like, no, TMR is a family-friendly show. No, we're not going to go there. We went there. Why am I here? <laughs> Ryan, let's, <laughs> let's talk about symbolism in art. Okay, so we talk, we've covered the emotive part where, you know, art is art because it speaks to people on different levels, some things that are ineffable, some things that are purely emotional. And then, and yet, there, uh, I mean, having, uh, I did take one, course of art history renaissance art history in, in college and I, I actually learned a lot because again I'm, a, I'm an engineer by trade and yet that helped open my you know perspective a little bit and learned a lot about the it, it's not just just a bunch of pretty pictures there's actually a lot of thought in structure format placement design ratios and and even you know symbolism not not fee but other ratios that, oh. that go into, um, you know, what what specific animals meant, right, of the time period. Like the way that people were sitting denotes something, who they're with, where they're placed, uh, where they're placed in frame. I mean, that alone was eye-opening because once you are exposed to that, it's like getting the secret Dakota ring, right? It's like for us masons it's like once you become a mason once you go through the three degrees or more you'll start to see things in literature and movies and stuff they're like i know a mason put something there and the same is true <laughs> for art history in general so um let's talk about symbolism and the creative process and how do you try to emulate those of all those those past masters um, yeah, so definitely with symbolism. I mean, the Renaissance is the easiest one to learn when people are trying to dive into symbolism because it's so blatant. Um, you know, it was thanks. People for have to remember my that. my uh, little bit of research. I yeah. appreciate it. Yeah, <laughs> no, but I mean, you got to remember, like <laughs> even Freemasons understood it. <laughs> uh, you know, everybody back then was illiterate for the most part. Um, they didn't hear scripture in their native tongue. They, you know, they heard it in Latin. Most people couldn't speak Latin or very well um, or read it. And, um, you know, so things had to be for them, extremely obvious for them to understand what they were looking at. So Mary was always in blue, you know, John the Baptist always wore, you know, the camel skin uh, robes. Um, you know, Jesus was always in gold or blue um, or purple. And, it, you know, for them, that was that was the language that they were doing. Art was was a specific language for it. For me, because I studied the Renaissance so much, that's kind of the way I brought it into my art. Um, in fact, most of the time when I have a commission or when I have an idea, I'm thinking about the symbolism before I even think of the image. Um, I love that. That's so, awesome. Yeah. So, like, it's. Um, you know, for example, you know, I did like the John the Baptist. Those were like my first figure paintings I ever did. Um, and I did it because I sucked at figure painting. So I'm like, all right, time to learn. Um, so, uh, you know, before I was even thinking about what the paintings were going to look like, I knew what I wanted to do on each side. And I said, all right, like 
this is not going to be a painting of just John the Baptist. It's going to be a, as above, so below painting. So I knew that, you know, one side is going to have to have an arrow in it pointing down. One side is going to have to have an arrow pointing up. Um, you know, I, I knew I wanted the elements and I wanted earth, air, wa uh, uh, earth, air, fire, and, and water. I wanted all of those to be in there. I wanted one to be outside. I wanted to be one to be inside. And um, I want, you know, and then I started literally just writing notes down, like, and I didn't know which painting was going to have it. So I wanted one person clothed. I wanted one person naked or somewhat naked, you know, one person with uh, a shoe on their foot and one without, uh, even though it wasn't really historically accurate. And then, you know, you do your research, you know, all right, how, how was this person represented back then? Um, even though it doesn't make histor make sense historically, you know, like, why would, why would John the Baptist hold a cross? Like that hadn't happened yet, but it's the symbolism that went with that. Um, so then basically I just like kind of divvied it out and said like, all right, this obviously has to go with this person. This person has to go with this one. And then it's, all right, how do I put this in there without being obvious? All right, well, the, the angles going down, I'm going to do out of clouds, the, the angle going up, I'm going to do out of curtains, um, you know, a veil and, kind of play it out in my head as, as I go along until I have an idea. Um, and then it's, you know, find inspiration. You know, the the problem with, well, I don't really have this problem anymore because people offered their services. But when I was first starting out, he was like, I couldn't get a model. Like if I went up to a brother and be like, hey, I need a job at the Baptist. You want to paint with me? They'd be like, that's great. You know, go pound sand. Um, now I say that and I get, I'll do it, I'll do it, I'll do it. Um, so for those paintings, I actually looked at sculptures and figured out like, all right, I'm going to paint this sculpture and just change it so that, yeah. Um, you got three volunteers. That'll fit the narrative and I'll use that as my model. Um, so that that's kind of how I start with symbolism on, on every project. You know, like, for example, I just got a commission for the three ancient grandmasters. Um, and I'm, I've bought all my uh, costumes and stuff like that, but... Um, what I really want to do the painting of is now chemical process. You know, I, I want it, I, I want it to be a painting of alchemy that people don't know about. So, you know, I've written down everything that I want to do in it. And that's where I start with. And, you know, when I, when I worked with this, this lodge that commissioned me for it, you know, I did a very, very rough drawing, like, all right, this is what I'm doing. This is really what it means. What do you think? And they went gaga over it. So, um, yeah, that's, how that's kind of how, all four of us just checked our PayPal balances to wait and see when this hits <laughs> RyanJFlynn.com so that we can buy it. Yes. <laughs> um, but yeah, like that, that's, that's really the way I, I think it's because I love the symbolism of, of art so much that I make that the point of what I do. <laughs> no, Ryan, can, can, you, I, can you unpack that a second? <laughs> You said you love, yeah. okay, you, you said like the symbolism of art, which I know you like just kind of talking and waxing poetic about your process, but something in there I think is almost like coded in the way, like, can you unpack that a little bit? The symbolism of art, like art as a symbol and also is a symbol. Yeah, like, so it's not a, it's not a blanket statement because it's different with every artist and with every work out there. And, and frankly, I don't like how people assume that symbolism of art is all these grandiose secrets. Like, Oh, this artist meant like something really, really dark and sinister because he put, you know, this person in the painting, like very rarely is that the case, but it's, you know, I always think that a good good work of art is is a message encoded for you, and and you have to deliver that message out of it, and 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 gather some sort of personal connection for it. Uh, like that's the great thing about art. You you can look at a great work of art and be like, wow, that's amazing. You know, like, all right, um, you know, like the Sistine Chapel, and you you look at individual pieces like you know the Expulsion of Paradise and. Like, this is a beautiful painting. I can see Eve and Ad Adam and Eve getting thrown out. And I understand what that is. And then you look at it deeper and you realize that's not an apple tree. That's a fig tree. Why is it a fig tree? What did what did Michelangelo know? All right, let's, right, right. let's dive into this more and understand that he's putting up something there that is not supposed to be there. 
in the time that he was supposed to be. And we have evidence that he knew what he was doing while he was up there. He understood the symbolism. There, That's right? the stuff that fascinates and, me. That's the stuff that I really yeah. enjoy. Yeah. So but at the same time, like we live in an age where if someone says it on, on social media, people believe it. And like, there's other sorts of symbolism that are, that are incredible. Like it drives me crazy to know and the BS that they put into Da Vinci. Like, and he is such an unbelievable person and historical figure and artist that he doesn't need that. Like, you know, there's his famous painting, the lady with an ermine that uh, he's holding there. Da Vinci dissect, figured out a way to gelatinize eyeballs so that he could dissect an eyeball to figure out exactly how much a pupil dilates when certain amounts of lights get on it so that he could reflect that into his painting. An optometrist has looked at that painting and discovered that the, di the diameter of the pupils in that is absolutely physically correct based on the amount of light that's hitting one side of her face to the other. Why does Mary Magdalene have to be involved in that? Is that not enough? You know? And, and that's symbolism, right? That, that's just the scientific symbolism that he put in there. Um, so being willing to, to realistically look at symbolism and, and, and discover like the true beauty of art is, is where that connection happens. Um, you know, for me, like for, for a personal example, I love seeing Monet's in real life because while other people are looking at this beautiful, you know, conglomeration of all these colors and textures and stuff like that. I will go right up to it as close as possible. I want to know why did he put yellow on top of blue? Why, why does that work over here? And it looks completely different over there. And just that color combination could be the symbolism of that painting that attracts me. But to the same point, someone who's standing 30 feet away saying that's a pretty cathedral, it, that's still symbolism to them. It's just on a different wavelength. Yeah, yeah, I, I agree. And it's again, that's part of the, the thing I enjoy because you, once you do some research, you feel like you're kind of let in on the secret, right? You, you understand, yeah. you get, you get the joke, right? It, it's like, it's like uh, reading the original Hebrew from the Old Testament. You're like, oh, now I get it. Why yeah. they use these Hebrew words because they sound alike. It's a pun rather than this, this weird English interpretation that makes no sense anymore. Mm. Um, and so yeah yeah you know, and like sometimes it's just a fun story too i remember like one of my favorite lessons that we got in in rome we were at the trevi fountain and you know this famous fountain that everybody knows and uh my teacher was like you see that giant urn on the side of it what do you think the symbolism of that is and if you look at it it's just out of place on one side of it there's this giant stone urn there that's out of place and we all came up with these great like ideas like well maybe it symbolizes you know it's relating to poseidon and it's a vessel he goes like no actually what happened there was a barber there who was nosy and kept telling the artist that he was doing it wrong so he carved a giant urn to block his view so that he couldn't see it anymore and that's why it's there like that's great symbolism <laughs> so um you know it's, it doesn't have to be deep and you know esoteric sometimes it's just finding that connection humor is a great connection to stuff too So, uh, ready for show and tell time? <laughs> okay. <laughs> Whoa, that's yeah. a loaded question. <laughs> oh, how are you doing? Let's go back to Florence. A family show. <laughs> oh, Florence, Italy, <laughs> with Ryan Flynn. Oops, so we... I dropped my pen. So we... <laughs> <laughs> Real <laughs> trap. Drop my paintbrush. All right, let's see. Sure, we got it a... wasn't the soap. We got a few things here. Let's see. We've got. How about the endurance of Sophia? Let's talk about uh, another figure for, uh, figure portrait here. Yeah, so... so describe um, this. It is no longer so, a family uh, show. Yeah. Um, it's art. Right? Um, yes. So I... <laughs> Where's Joe's face? We could put it in here. Um, I have um, this. <laughs> it's in my office. <laughs> so... Um, this was one of the first paintings I did as a Masonic artist that like, I just had an idea and went with it. This wasn't a commission. This wasn't um, based on anything. And it really was um, a reaction to a time where I was just getting out of the, is this it phase of Masonry? You know, I wasn't being um, exposed to the deep stuff, but I knew it was out there. And um, 
I had this idea, you know, like Sophia being the personification of wisdom. Um, I had this idea of, you know, wisdom's not, wisdom's still out there. It's just waiting for you to discover her. So I had this idea of, you know, like an abandoned Sophia who's been stripped of a lot of the, the stuff that's, you know, the glamour. Um, but she's still there waiting for someone to, to find her again. Um, so again, I started with the symbolism. Like, all right, what, what do I, what do I want? Well, um, you know, with Renaissance symbolism and stuff, nudity is not really for nudity's sake, especially in women. It means, um, there's, there's no shame in her. Like, so Sophia has no shame. So I knew I wanted her to be partly nude. Um, I also knew that I wanted her to be in ruins because, you know, I want the temple to be ruined, but she's still there. Like all the superficial stuff needs to be taken apart and, 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 um, you know, dismantled, but she's still there in her perfect form. And, um, that, that kind of got me going here. Um, so then I started researching, I'm like, well, how do, how do I show that I want someone to go to her? I want, how do I show a journey? Well, okay, I looked up some, some books and I found out that a bridge is, is typically a symbol in the Renaissance of, of a journey or, or a pathway forward over troubled waters, you know? So now it's showing it's not an easy journey. So this bridge scene in her back, uh, behind her is this idea of a troubled, uh, journey towards her. Um, and then I just kind of started figuring out in kind of honing in the symbolism like do i want her just in ruins or do i want something behind her a ruins of a temple or and uh this idea popped into me as a triumphal arch so if you go into rome you know you have the arch of constantine which is right outside of of um of uh the the Colosseum, and it kind of looked like this so i i took that triumphal arch and and dismantled it and made it into ruins and then, of course, we have the dark forest behind her, too, which is the idea of, of you know, entering a world of um, uncertainty and turmoil. And then, of course, you put her on this, this ashlar with symbols of masonry and mortality around her. And um, I put these cuffs on her hand and I took, uh, I took rose, uh, colors from Rosicrucianism and put those in there and let her sit there and wait. And uh, it... it it was a big risk for me because it's a large painting. And I, um, I remember like, I don't think anybody's going to get this. So, um, I brought it to Masonicon of all places and uh, Brian gave me a table and I popped it up and I was there for exactly <laughs> maybe 20 minutes. And a brother came up to me and he was like, what's this about? And, um, uh, I explained a bare minimum of what I just did. And he was just like, yeah, I want it. And all of a sudden I was a professional artist. <laughs> um, so that was really my first large scale painting that I sold, uh, that was mine, my, my creation. Dude, that is like so brilliant. I had no idea. So Ryan, I had not met you before that first Masonic con where I met you there and we had so much fun and you were so, uh, jovial and, uh, just a, an awesome dude. Yeah. Like, Hey, you guys all remember, but anyway, it was awesome to meet you. I had no idea, um, that that had been your, your, your first like major painting sale, like the thing that you did that you sold because you had been so professional and so knowledgeable about everything that you had talked about up to that point. I had no question in my mind. I just, if you had told me you have a, you have a gallery in New York and, you do these paintings and people buy them. I wouldn't have second guessed you for a second. Um, and I'm not like some lame, you know, lame with art. Like I know art. So, I mean, that's, that's awesome, man. That's a really cool story. And um, I didn't know that yeah. before. <laughs> so, yeah. I had done really a, cool. I had done a tracing board before, which was purchased by a lodge, which I'm now a member of, but um, uh, I wasn't at the time. And that, that was just tracing board, you know, that wasn't figure based or anything like that. And I, the reason I painted this was, um, well, one of the reasons was I was horrible at painting the human form. I, I just never, and I was always afraid of failing. And honestly, it sounds kind of cheesy, but masonry has definitely pushed me to be like, you can do better. Like the only, you know, one of these lessons that I've gotten out of this is like, no, you're, you're an apprentice, be a master. Um, if you, if, you know, I remember saying I'll never do portraits because they're too hard. Like, 
all right and uh, honest i honestly it sounds cheesy but masonry made me go like well no, you got like doing this you got like ten thousand people in your back corner, you know, cheering you on to go. So we're like, yeah. do it, do yeah, awesome, do stuff. better. We'll buy your stuff. Yeah. <laughs> and you've got a bunch of portraits now. Yeah, yeah. now I'm. Starting they look to do amazing. Mm -hmm. So let's. Yeah, uh, my favorite one I've still done is still my daughter. Like I, I painted that for her, that. and I'm gonna do my other daughter. And that was a COVID painting, so it was just like, all right, I need to do something, and it turned out to be a. A lot harder to paint her dress than her face. You know, when I paint my other daughter, she is wearing a solid colored shirt. <laughs> yes. Okay, kid, <laughs> wear a white shirt and you're good to go. Yeah, exactly. So let's talk about uh, other murals as well. So uh, I think you've you've done at least one lodge, one complete lodge set of murals. You want, you want to talk about that? Yeah, so Blackmer is... Blackmer's a story and a half. <laughs> um, so... Uh, Ben Wallace, uh, who we all know and love, uh, I was down there talking at Sophia Lodge, and he just, he randomly said, like, hey, buddy, um, I need you to come to this other lodge, which is in town next to his, in Mount Gilead. So we're sitting in there, and it's a lodge that's, you know, it's got the uh, the paneling on the sides, and he's like, yeah, yeah, you like this place? I'm like, it's a great little lodge, you know? And he goes, like, yeah, I need you to do murals for these. And, you know, I kind of reminded him, like, so this is North Carolina and uh, I live in New Hampshire. That's, that's going to be tough. <laughs> um, he's like, yeah, we'll, we'll figure it out. So um, again, uh, you know, I agreed to do it. I had no idea how I was going to do it. Um, I was very, very fortunate that Ben had uh, two friends, uh, two ladies who uh, one was an art teacher and one was artistic. And um, I knew I had two, two helpers down there, which was like, all right, now that we have a chance. Um, so again, I, I had four walls to do and, um, I started off with a idea of symbolism and just knowing the guys in the lodge, I said like, all right, I'm going to paint a story of Kabbalah. Uh, this, this temple is going to be painted as masonry, but it's really going to be a painting of Kabbalah. And, um, I had this idea. I was like, all right. Uh, what do I want to accomplish? Well, I want, it, I want it to be a tracing board and I want it to be something else. And then I had this, I don't know where it came from, but I was like, what if, if I look down at the lodge, it's a giant tree of life, like, but no one could know. So um, I don't know. I know enough about Kabbalah to be like, that's Kabbalah. And it, okay, explain that, Ryan. Well, that's Kabbalah. Uh, <laughs> it's, it's Jewish. Um, so um, I had to do some learning and, um, for about seven months, I planned, planned the painting. Um, and what it started with is just, you know, learning basics about the Sarah, uh, I can't even talk right now. Um, yeah, the Sephiroth. Mm -hmm. Sephiroth. Thank you. I couldn't mm -hmm. say it. Um, and I, I got a gist of it. And then I was like, why, why am I trying to figure this out? I know so many people <laughs> who know this stuff. So I remember like, calling Greg Kaminsky. And I was just like, all right, here's my idea. And he's like, I'm, I'm helping you. Like, you know, like he was like all aboard. So, um, you know, he taught me about like the colors that, you know, interact with each one and, you know, the, the, the meanings behind it. So I said, all right, so I know like a red one has to go here, I know, you know, a green one here and here and here, gold is up there. And um, then I was like, all right, so I know I have these niches that I want to do. And then it, how do I tie this all together? And believe it or not, I thought of Florence. Uh, so oh, um, wait, wait for it. everybody. Drink. <laughs> did you study there? Um, I did. So one of the cool places that you oh. go to that I went to over there is St. Mark's, which is a, um, um, a it's a courtyard in a, in a place where Michelangelo learned how to carve. And it's also the place where the Medici, and um, uh, would have their platonic meetings and stuff. So you're sitting in the room where all this happened. And I thought, well, why don't I paint that courtyard? So the courtyard looks like that. It has arches all the way around it. And I said, all right, well, okay, now I have a courtyard. Well, let's put the pillars around it. So now we have, you know, our tracing board for architecture on each side. 
And then on each side, of, inside of each of these niches, I'm going to have elements that that make up not only a Masonic tracing board, but a line to the tree of life. So for example, I had one that had, um, like uh, we had Noah and Moses in one, and I knew that those had to be painted in gray. Uh, and then I decided I wanted to put the, um, you know, the, uh, the ancient muses in there as well, so that those line up with it. And I came up with this idea where you have like one side, all of these niches on one side have the feminine uh, column, one side has the, the, the masculine. Um, inside of each of these emblems would be, uh, in, excuse me, inside of each of these niches would be an archway and in the archway would be an emblem that is a very basic Masonic form. So I have the working tools and then faith, open charity and the four cardinal virtues. So those are all in there. So if you were going to be using these, these um, images to teach a new EA, it's right there. But then I also started thinking, all right, how do I put more and more symbolism? Because I really was trying to do was have something that you could use at every level of Masonic knowledge where, all right, I have something blatantly obvious. All right, now I have something a little bit more like, um, you know, we have Adam and Eve here. We can talk about Adam. You know, I have someone holding a mask because, you know, there's a, you know, you can use masks to talk about the true Ashler and the true self. Um, so eventually after seven months, I had it planned down to um, exactly what you saw before. I was really happy with it. I I showed Ben um, uh, the sketch and he was, he was crazy. Uh, he went crazy over it. So um, this is where it gets kind of unbelievable. I don't really know how I did this, but um, I sent all of the images down to uh, Ben and uh and the two ladies who were helping me and they traced it on the wall for me. So they basically put a, a clear um, um, gesso on the wall and then they drew all of these up using a projector. And I flew down on a Thursday and I didn't stop painting until Sunday. Um, so I think I did 54 hours of, of painting in, in three days uh, and painted the whole room. And um, uh you know, Angela and them would, um, Angela and Debbie did the, the, the for me inside. So at the end of it, it looks like what you're showing right now. Then uh, by some odd uh, coincidence, um, I had designed that rose window that you see in there um, for something else. And it's a, it's a master mason tracing board that I designed for stained glass. And what we did is we printed it on plexiglass and put it in there and lit it up. So when someone's going through their master Mason degree, you can use that as a tracing board for it. So now what you're seeing in this room for the Masons in the room is, you know, a tracing board for all the degrees. You, you can, every aspect of the fellow craft degree is in, in it. Um, every aspect of the entered apprentice degree is in it. And now you have a master Mason tracing board. And then if you want to get into the more esoteric stuff, there's, there's hints of Rosicrucianism. Um, there's, there's a lot of, um, references to, um, hermeticism and, and obviously Kabbalah, but, um, I finished that and, uh, it, it was, it was like, okay, you know, I was kind of in shock that it, it got completed and, um, it's beautiful. Yeah. Absolutely I, the, beautiful. the thing is though, I painted it so fast that my sketches I'm proud of, but every time I go down there, I want to bring a paint and brush and just be like, Ben, give me, See, give me two You got to stop. That, that's the hardest part about being an artist is, is knowing know. when, knowing when to, uh, to stop. To break the brush. But, um, there break it is. The there it is. And there's Ben. It just needs a dome on that building now. <laughs> I love the, I love the, let me stop sharing. I love the difference between the outside of Blackmore Lodge and once you walk inside, because when John and inside. I went, we were yeah. like, yeah, let's, oh, this is a cool looking lodge. And then we walked inside and we were like, oh my God. <laughs> it's very dichotomous. Thanks to you. Thanks to Ryan J. Flynn. I mean, seriously, like it can't be understated that not only was that a labor of love, but holy smokes, you, you transformed, you manifested something beautiful that just gives everyone in that lodge a new experience every time they, they visit lodge and that's i'll somewhat disagree with fast. you though because nope, nope not, uh, allowed. not allowed i, I painted the walls and if they Mute didn't him. have a Mute wall him. seriously 
if the, if they didn't have a lodge of members that were like completely embracing that that sort of thing and just all about bettering their lodge, it would never have happened. You know, uh, it's this is not me tr trying to be like ultra humble or anything like that. But you know, with, without those guys who just said we can do better, it, what I, I'm Schmucky the Clown painting pretty pictures on a wall. Okay, so. <laughs> Um, no, no, and, and I know that's yeah. a lie, and I know that's a lie, here's why, because I have actually flipped through your sketchbook for that lodge, mm -hmm. and I have <laughs> seen the creative process of Ryan J. Flynn, which is only just scratched upon the surface in this episode, and uh, I'm not gonna lie, like, just that, that's, scr you know how, like, we, we, I'm not, you know, l allow me to stroke your ego a little bit, because... You know how we like look through Da Vinci's sketchbooks and like you know like oh wow this is so cool like we can get you can get a peek into the creative process of Da Vinci, you know I I was I was loving flipping through uh, your design process for Blackmore Lodge because it's uh it, it is a, a beauty in its own, Joe, uh, I was too and easy. I may have I, I may have I may have contributed more to your sketchbook than you originally put in there but Mustaches. next time you go down there you can see it. All right, so I know we're running short on time, but I did. I know I want to say right now. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't. I'm kidding. Uh, we, you did a great job talking about your uh, Prince Hall portrait on Historical Light. I don't want to rehash that. But that was a wonderful episode. If you haven't checked that out, go check out Historical Light and Alex Powers' podcast, where you go through the design process and historical research. You went into that, but I also I want to end this episode on these four beautiful Ooh. ladies. <laughs> yeah, so um, I, I was commissioned by a lodge in Jersey uh, to, to do these. And um, he said he wanted the four cardinal virtues. And um, I really took up the challenge because, again, I'm still not happy with... Um, I, I think my paintings look very good from far away, but they bug me when they're closer. So I... I, I thought like, all right, what, what are the things I really struggle with? Like flesh tones, figure and drapery. I'm like, great. All right, let's, let's hit these, let's hit these hard. Um, so, um, like I was saying before, earlier on in my career, it was hard for me to find models. Uh, this time it was just like asking friends like, Hey, do you want to pose for me? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I want to do it. So, um, you know, uh, a dear friend of mine proposed for, um, for fortitude there in the red dress. And then uh, my friend Melanie, who posed for Justice, her daughter posed for uh, Prudence, and her daughter's best friend uh, posed for for Temperance. So um, basically, I took everything out of my garage, set up a lighting studio in there, and and brought them all in um, to to take some photos. And um, it, it was uh, it was uh, it was challenging, but it was really fun to paint these. Um, because first of all, it's four pieces. They're, they're quite large. Uh, they're all four feet tall. Um, wow. so, um, yeah, again, it was, it was going back and figuring out the, the symbolism that I wanted to do. So this was a commission and obviously anytime a commission happens, the, the commissioner will tell you what he or she wants. And, and this commissioner, uh, blatantly said, you know, like I want a version of the classical representation of, um, of these four, uh, four virtues. So I knew the symbolism that was in there, but what I didn't want to do was have the, the same old, um, uh, you know, static looking, I am holding a sword and a scale, uh, Greek you know, statues. That, that. Yeah, exactly. So I, I wanted to do this as more of a realistic and, and they're posed, but they're not, they're not formally posed. Right. Um, and then, I had this idea was like, so the, I knew where the paintings were going to go. Cause there was these four niches that were high up in the lodge room. So I said, well, I had the idea of like, all right, maybe they're windows. So if, if these people are in these windows, you're not going to see their whole body. Um, so what if I did waist up for most of these so that it looks like they're actually sitting in these, these, uh, enclaves. So, um, you know, again, I proposed the sketches to him and he, he went nuts. So, um, this was really just kind of a labor of love. I had the pictures that I was going to work with, um, and, you know, just started painting. Um, and it took me a long time to do, them, but, um, 
you know, they it, it wasn't as in depth as a lot of my other stuff, symbolically speaking, but it fit the commission and it fit the space. So sometimes a little subtle subtlety works more than going absolutely nuts. Absolutely. All right. Well, well uh, thank you for that because uh, it's certainly uh, paid off because it's you, you know you you're you're underselling yourself, Ryan, and, and then you're it's really uh, beautiful artwork with a lot of a lot of symbolism in there. And so I appreciate you coming on and sharing your process your ideas your thoughts and so uh for the the final question of the night i'm gonna let each host ask you one last question as they sign off so we'll start with jason why don't you ask one final question to our oh man Uh, (laughs) florence that's mine florence (laughs) um so I think when, you know, when you were when, somewhere around when you were you were first really starting out, one of the things that I just absolutely loved was your use of gold in your artwork and, and your prints. Um, especially, you know, I've got I've got your your, um, you know, pillars series you know one of them up there um i know there was there was a gilded version of that you did the um you did the patent for uh, the tm archon in 2017 um what is like if you had to nail down one thing um about your creative process working on something for for the craft like what is the one thing that like gives you goosebumps every single time um i honestly no you know you know it sounds kind of corny but like for my patents, for example, like the, I had seen so much mediocre stuff out there. And, you know, like when I, when I became a Mason, I got a, a, you know, a copy of a copy of a copy of a, of a certificate for when I was a Mason. And, um, you know, that, that was, uh, I'm not saying I, I cherished it obviously, but, you know, to be able to go, and say like, all right, I'm going to do this on a level it hasn't been done with in a long time. That that kind of gets my goosebumps up. Um, that that's one side, and and the other side is I've been extremely fortunate to um, do works of art that have hit certain masons personally. Um, you know, when I did my, um, I call it in my in my in thy name, we have assembled painting, uh, which is a painting of a brother who is praying at an altar uh, from a profile, you know, I, I, that was taken from a picture of a, a Mason who has since passed, but um, uh, his name's Max. And, you know, I gave him a copy of it. And uh, when he passed, I met his wife for the first time. And, you know, like she embraced me, just thanking me so much for doing the painting. And that, that really, that really hit me hard. Um, and then when, when I gave away Prince Hall and seeing the look on DT's face when he got it, it was just like, there's nothing in masonry that tops this. So, um, yeah, it's kind of like twofold. Like, that that hit me in the feel. I, I, I tear up thinking about it sometimes just because I know how much it affected him. So, yeah, there's there's the the effort and the pain going into it motivates me. And then, you know, when you get those reactions, it's you, you can't describe it. Awesome. All right. Thank you. Uh, Joe, question for Ryan. No, I do not have a question for Ryan. So I am not going to, I'm not going to be put on the spot and come up with a random question. I am just going to say, um, you know, me brother, I I've been a fan of you since before we met. And I remember the first time we met, it was also at Masonic con. Um, but I just wanted to publicly say, thank you. Thank you so much for, giving a lens to a lot of the things that we, especially me as, as Freemasons 
look to gain out of out of life um, and your work, especially the ones that I like the most, um, <laughs> give a lens to all the different symbols and concepts and allegories um, and, and you put them you put them to paper or to, to canvas in, in a way that nobody's done in a very, very long time. So, um, you know, so instead of asking you a question, I'm just going to say thank you from the bottom of my heart for doing what you do. Um, it's, it's truly inspired many and it, it's just a source of, of both joy and solace to, to tons of people. So thank you so much. Oh man. I appreciate it. You're making me look really tough right now, which is, which is awesome. So <laughs> boom, that's what I do. Florence, Italy, 2022. <laughs> Let's make it happen. All right, RJ. Man, so I, I I don't know why I knew this question was going to be this question. And I had all these questions in my head. And uh, the first question I was going to say was like, what's up with the weird Ren art, you know, 1520s, like things like Visions of Tundale. Like I wanted to get your impression on that. That's going to be like a whole nother topic sometime. Um, I, I wanted to I wanted to ask you if you were gonna, if you're ever going to get into NFTs. Um, but I, I think I want to ask you kind of a, a question on your personal opinion. Uh, you know, some artwork, people can just look at it and immediately see some kind of message that's both profound and obvious. Other times, you know, you, you talked about symbolism and in the chat running alongside the YouTube video, people were like, sometimes a cigar is a cigar. Sometimes there's too much symbolism. And maybe somewhere in there that has something to do with this. But my question is, can there be, I mean, I have my own opinion on this, but can there be the same uh, profoundness in paintings um, that are both visually stunning, but not so obvious. And do we have, ex do, are there examples of those paintings that are cherished today? Or do you still feel like, I shouldn't say still, because I don't know if you feel this way at all. Do you feel like people just focus on the most well-known paintings in the world, like the Mona Lisa, which is like, you know, I, when I found out how big the Mona Lisa was, I was like, what? But you yeah. get my question. That's it. Yeah. So, um, First of all, I agree with whoever said a cigar is sometimes a cigar. Um, I think there is, well, I, I shouldn't say that. I know there is a significant difference between interpretation and intent. So just because a Mason, or Mason, excuse me, just because an artist painted something and you see something in it doesn't mean the artist meant to do it. You know, case in point, The Last okay. Supper. That's not my But everybody sees it and it goes down a rabbit hole and they learn all about this other side of Christianity and these other, um, you know, pathways that people go around. That's great. You know, that's your interpretation. I have a problem with it when you say that's what he did because he, you know, that's his message. It's not. Um, so I agree with that, but I, I think, um, you know, with that in mind, embrace your interpretation as long as it's not complete BS, uh, you know, um, I've seen some go very wrong. I remember doing research at one point and I somehow found myself into a chat room where a bunch of neo-Nazis were taking over a chat room saying that all of Norman Rockwell's paintings were about white supremacy. And I was like, mm -hmm, not going to chime in here, but Whoa. that's, um, but that's their interpretation, not based on fact, but um, for examples of, of paintings that are like that. I, first of all, I agree with you because on the, on the grounds of like the famous paintings, because unfortunately the arts are taken away from a lot of people, especially in school and, and the sugar coated condensed version of what art is, is compressed into whatever's worth the most money, you know? Um, all right. The, the Mona Lisa is this beautiful thing. Well, you know, again, like the Mona Lisa is famous because someone stole it and that's really it. Um, but, you know, when it comes to just learning how to appreciate art rather than the artworks itself, those interpretations and those personal connections will blossom. I mean, I have, um, of course, I can't think of the name of this. I can't think of the artist's name right now, which is 
bugging me. I have a painting in my studio uh, of it's called the girl in Pompeii. And um, it's basically a, 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 an outdoor painting of a girl who has stopped cleaning off the ruins of Pompeii and is of Pompeii and is looking at the at the murals. And I love that painting. I don't know anything about it, but what I see in it is my interpretation and my connection to the painting is that's what I want my my two girls to be. I want them to be able to stop and admire the beauty that's around them and really think about it. Does that is that the meaning of the painting by, you know, what the artist intended? I have no idea. I, I really haven't studied the painting and I don't really want to because I love my interpretation of it. There it is. You know, and if you look at this painting, you know, again, if you learn to look at art and you learn to embrace it, you know, there's this little thing that's happening in this painting, whereas the girl behind her is starting to look around and see what she's doing. And this this story that goes through my head is like, maybe she's seeing this girl embrace, embrace this artwork and maybe she's about to do it the same. She might be saying, you're an idiot, get back to work. But there's that that narrative that's happening in the painting and I love it. So I've I've had that in my uh, in my studio since I ever saw it, and um, I think that's a good example of what you were talking about. If it isn't, I'm sorry about that. No, that's a great answer. I really appreciate the insight. I think uh, that gives me a greater insight into how you view art. So I really appreciate it. Thanks, Ryan. Yeah, no. I, I think even an easier way to say it is music. Music's a form of art. We all have music that hits us in the feels. And some people like gangster rap, some people like only classical music. And, you know, um, who am I to say which one's right? Because there is no right. It's it's all a form of expression. And whatever you gravitate towards is good for you. But at the same time, you shouldn't be saying that that music's crap because I don't like it. Because, again, like I said before, people on their deathbeds are wheeled into MoMA every year to see one last splash of paint on a wall. And obviously it means that much to them. So how dare I say that it's not up to my standards and my standards are the rule and guide of art, you know? Unless it's country. Or Cardi B. <laughs> Don't you be knocking Johnny Cash. <laughs> no, 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 no. Not that kind of country. All right. So what? let's, uh, let me get it. Let me get a word in edgewise. Uh, so the question I have for Cause you. Cause that never happens. I can mute you. you know, <laughs> is Okay. <laughs> So I, I got a fun one. <laughs> this, this is a fun one. If you had unlimited time, unlimited budget, what would you personally like to take on as a, as a, an art piece of artwork? I have something I've been John sketching. <laughs> um, no, so uh, I sketched an idea out a while ago. I actually had a place for it, but I knew that it was never going to be welcome there. So I stopped pursuing it, but um, in an easy way to describe it as a Masonic school of Athens. Um, so a bunch of Masonic philosophers and, and people who influenced Masonry standing on the steps of the temple with the two pillars behind it. Um, I think the big thing that I liked about my idea was it progressed over time. So we start with the people that we all know in the back, you know, we could, we could start with the three ancient grand masters in the middle of it. And it progresses down through the craft through like Wilmshurst and all those guys. And, um, Ooh, nice. the thing I really liked about my idea was at the bottom would be the people today doing it because I, I really, it really irks me that a lot of Masonic education ignores the people who are doing the work today. Um, because there are some amazingly influential people out there who know what they are talking about. And there are amazing Masons out there who are walking the walk, not just talking the talk. And I thought that would be just this great painting to do, but there was no way I could do it unless it was gigantic, uh, you know, 40 feet wide is what I was, oh, what I was thinking. And it would that's take a great idea. It would take, it would take forever. Uh, I would need to, uh, Kickstarter. Kickstarter. Yeah, Kickstarter for about, seven years salary so <laughs> um but somewhere. yeah that that was a that's kind of a dream project um and i still i want to go sistine chapel on the ceiling i, yeah. I just want that's i awesome. i've done I've, I've done clouds on the ceiling i want to get up there and let me do my thing <laughs> but maybe someday 
All right. Well, uh, that is that is a great answer, and I'm, I'm glad you shared your your vision. So one day, one day it will happen. You have to manifest it. Make yeah. it happen. Uh, Copyright so where, 2022 from Jay Flynn. Yes, you've got that down. <laughs> so where can we <laughs> find and hopefully purchase some of your pieces of art? Oh, um, so I have my website, uh, RyanJFlynn.com. Um, so I have certain prints there that are available. And then uh, a lot of my work is now available on MasonicRevival.com. So um, either or would nice. be great. And um, I've kind of been selective, which is on my website. And um, the more uh, the smaller prints, many of them signed uh, are on Masonic Revival. And um, if you need commissions or if you need help working with another artist in, in your area to get something done, uh, consider me a consultant that works for free and I'll, I'll help you out and maybe point you towards a project. And, you know, I just want to see the arts flourish in the craft. So if you need help or need questions, send them my way. Awesome. I got to, uh, real quick, uh, just so everybody else knows Masonic con New Hampshire is Masonic con Yeah. Those are, mm -hmm. those tickets are out. Um, Actually, I don't know if the tickets are. You got tickets for sale yet, Ryan? Yes, we need to sell them. So please. <laughs> yeah, go buy the tickets. Buy your tickets. Go Get buy your tickets. tickets. June 4th. June 4th, 2022. Yep. Bring your tickets to Lee State. So if they don't like what we're talking about, they can go there. <laughs> well, there you go. Yeah. But awesome. yeah, we, it's going to be a great time. So hopefully uh, I'll see some of you guys there. Excellent. Well, cool. Thanks again, Ryan. Uh, this is a fa fascinating conversation, one that was well overdue. So thank you for coming on. And uh, that's it. So if you guys enjoy this, we'll see you next week. And as always, thanks for watching and keep searching for more light. Have a good night.